Great to see you on a semi-stormy Wednesday uh, afternoon. I know on my commute from uh, Fredericksburg, it was quite uh, rainy. Um, and it didn't seem to make its way here, but we had trees come down in Fredericksburg and everything else. So uh, we'll see. Maybe get some rain later on this evening. But let's open up in a word of prayer, and then we will open it up for some prayer requests and praises. Father, we thank you so much that we can gather together to learn from your word tonight, to encourage, one in, uh, encourage each other, God, to lift up each other's burdens. And we ask, God, that you would just give us great insight tonight as we learn and study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, who will be first or second or third with a prayer request or praise this evening? Of course, lifting up many in our church who are sick with either just regular colds, fevers, some with COVID. So we want to continue lifting up those uh, individuals and seeing those updates there on the church Facebook page. And uh, Dad, we're coming with a microphone to you. Pray for my mom. Um, found out she does have cancer. Okay. So um, I think she's going to meet with the oncologist uh, soon to find out a plan. Okay. So, and, and continue to pray for Kristen Dove. So praying for Kristen Dove with cancer and then Jane Morgan with cancer and uh, meeting with the oncologist soon. Uh, and uh, the Martin family. That loss of uh, mom. The Martin Camille. family? Martin. Oh, yes. Martin. So my parents' uh, neighbors, the Martins, uh, Camille passed away this week. So be lifting uh, them up. Kind of younger kids in their late, t mid to late 20s, I guess I would say. So be praying for them as they make decisions. Dave, would you mind lifting up these few requests, please, if you could? Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. And thank you for health and strength that we enjoy. And Lord, uh, <clears throat> for these prayer requests mentioned um, by Kenny, um, for his mom and for the Martins. And, and uh, there is another prayer request. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for knowing what we need when we need it. And, uh, Lord, uh, be with those that are uh, sick, either with uh, the bug or with COVID or, or what, whatever, Lord. Thank you for meeting our needs, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Andrew. I just wanted to share a praise and a prayer request uh, for Donna. Uh, she had a small lesion removed yesterday. They... They said it was contained, but they didn't like the, the way it looked. But uh, she went through the procedure fine, and uh, she's resting. And she goes, she, it was so small, they called it a biopsy. So she goes back for an, a, a post-op appointment in two weeks. Um, okay. So if you'd continue praying. We will definitely lift up Donna and appraise that that went well. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else with a prayer request or praise? Stephen. I just want to give a, a praise the gentleman we've been praying for in New York, Brian Kelly with the church ministry. He went from last week, it was like 11 to, I think he's over 12,000 now, it was like 12,200 and he's still rejoicing even if it's like a dollar, six dollars, little things like that. He makes a post about it and he's super happy. So it really sounds like the Lord's hand is up on this. Um, and it's like just really unique because it'll just be like random, like small donations, big donations, but just please keep praying for him because he's really excited for it. and. I think, he, I think the Lord's really going to make it happen pretty soon. So That is great. How much do they need total? 25? Uh, he needs about 24000 total. They're okay. about 12000 or $300, somewhere around there. Nice. Halfway there. That's exciting, especially with the ministry in kind of New York, downtown New York City, right? Kind of in the heart of everything. So be lifting uh, that ministry up as well. His last name is Brian Kelly? Okay. Okay. So we'll lift him up. Anyone else before we pray for these requests? Troy? Coming with a mic so we can all hear for those online as well. Pray for one of our second cousins on Becky's side. Um, Ashley Brown, she 
delivered a stillborn baby late last week and they laid the baby to rest this week. Um, she and her husband and our cousin are tore up, but they're also trusting God. Yeah. All right. That's a difficult situation. Ashley Brown, your cousin. Okay. Let's lift these requests up. Father, we do thank you that uh, Brian Kelly's ministry and the, the donations that are coming in are, uh, that's going well. We pray that uh, he would be able to get fully funded, perhaps much uh, quicker than anticipated. And God, we ask that you continue to bless that track ministry there as they share the gospel to many cultures, many languages. God, I pray that there would be nothing uh, that gets in their way. I know the devil would love nothing more to, than to just put a big wrench in that situation, God. But we ask that you would continue to help it thrive. And that most importantly, many people would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Donna's uh, procedure went well the other day, and we praise you for that. Thank you that she's re at home recovering. We pray that the follow-up appointment would go well and that uh, you would bless her in that regard. And uh, thank you uh, for Andrew sharing that with us tonight. And then this really difficult situation with uh, Ashley Brown and the, the stillborn baby God, that has got to be an extremely uh, difficult situation to walk through. Most have never experienced that, most never will, but we, we lift this situation up to you. We pray for your comfort. We pray for uh, those around them as they try to comfort them uh, in any way that we can, they can, and we just lift that situation up to you, God, and we're trusting you, that, and we know that you know exactly what uh, you're doing in their lives, and we pray that they would just receive that and that they would be overwhelmed with comfort that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Wednesday. It's almost Friday. It's almost the weekend, Lord willing. Are you feeling the week so far? Yeah. I know I know. I am. Man, Mondays and Wednesdays, I typically use a lot of brain power in the way my schedule works. So my brain is here, and I'm ready to preach the word tonight, but man... I don't want to think about grass or flowers or trees or plants or customers or anything like that tonight. I know Michael can probably say the same thing. All right, anyone else with a prayer request or praise? No? VBS? Last chance. Yeah, so let's lift up VBS. That starts, of course, on Monday with the workday on Saturday. You can see the set is already coming together, some decorations out there, and most importantly, not just for a great fun time, but ultimately it's to point kids to Jesus. You know, if they never hear about Jesus or they never place their faith in Christ, then the Laffy Taffy and the Starburst are never worth it, right? I mean, kids come for candy, but more importantly, they're, we want to give them the spiritual uh, lesson. So I know some parents wish we wouldn't give them as much candy as we do, but candy is so good. So VBS, definitely. Yes, Bobby? We have a microphone for you so all can hear. Pray for a miracle for, I, I always pronounce this name wrong, Ian? Ian Romain. Ian. Yes, yes, please. Is there any update other than, I guess, uh, parents kind of doing fun things and just kind of still walking with Ian through the situation? Okay, I know. Similar update to Sunday. So be lifting up Ian Romain. You know, challenging. I would never want that to happen to my child, and it's just hard to even imagine and in God's will and sovereignty, he's chosen for them to kind of go through this situation. And, um, you know, we just need to trust God. It's, it's easy to say that, you know, because that's kind of cliche, trust God. You know, but that really is the case. And God knows exactly what's going on. And we do need to lean on God in these situations. So be lifting up Ian Romaine and VBS. Anyone else? It's a little bit of a quiet crowd tonight, so we may jump right into the scriptures. Michael, would you mind lifting up Ian uh, tonight, and then uh, VBS as well, if you could, please. Thank you. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and we thank, for, thank you for the opportunity we have to get together and worship in your house. Lord, we lift up Ian Romaine. God, I, I personally, I can't even imagine, you know, this situation. God, we're trusting you for a miracle, Lord, to heal him, but God, if not, you know, we know that your will 
is, all, is best. And God, I pray that you would just be with the family. Help them through this time. I pray that your grace would be sufficient. And God, I also lift up VBS. I pray that you would bless it in a special way. I pray that we would see lives changed and uh, kids saved as well. God, I pray you'd be with the workers. Help them to be in a right spirit heading into the week. And I pray you would just have your hand upon it. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go to the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As we begin our series entitled Momentum. And it's, the title is interesting tonight because when you think of momentum, you may not necessarily think about the word position and equate those two uh, together. But hear me out, we're going to kind of explain that. And over the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about the Christian life and the momentum, the, and the expectations. What are the expectations of us as Christians? What is the expectation of someone who is not a Christian? Well, really, from a spiritual perspective, there can be no growth that takes place until someone places their faith in Jesus Christ. But we'll look at that. The responsibility of a Christian, the responsibility, responsibility of a church member. How are we... As the body of Christ, locally, globally, what are our responsibilities? We all have jobs, mostly, if, if you're not retired. Um, and if you're retired, I'm sure you have some sort of job, even around the house or this or that. You have goals and tasks that you accomplish. And so what does that look like from a Christian perspective, from a life set apart from the world and to Jesus Christ? You know, our family has recently got into kayaking, and I talked about this, I think, last week or the week before. And in kayaking, when the momentum is there, you do well. You're paddling. It's an enjoyable time. Well, we went kayaking this past Saturday. And uh, who remembers the, the winds from Saturday? Does anybody remember that? I know I, I called my dad and I said, hey, we're going kayaking. What? It's too windy out there. I said, we're not going to, you know, we stay close to the shore. But man, we're out there paddling and you could literally face your kayak uh, and paddle and you could sit still and the wind would just turn you in the opposite direction. You could paddle and you would go nowhere. I don't know how much the wind was blowing, but out on the water, it's definitely more than when you're surrounded by uh, trees and, and land. So needless to say, we were lacking momentum. Perhaps your 401k right now is lacking momentum. Can I get an amen on that? Just don't check that thing, okay? Just ride it out. Ride it out, as one financial person says, the only people who get hurt on roller coasters are the ones who jump off. So, yeah, no momentum in your 401k right now. Uh, maybe not in your budget, right? Maybe you're paying, uh, you know, a pack of hot dogs was a dollar. Maybe they're like $2 now. I'm like, man, catfish is, catfishing is getting expensive. Hot dogs are $2 instead of $1 or whatever it may be in your life, we all like to be moving forward in some regard. Momentum, well, what is the definition of momentum? It's uh, movement, it's motion, it's a property of a moving body that determines the length of time required to bring it to rest when under the action of a constant force or moment. So momentum in the Christian life. Are we ever supposed to stop growing in our Christian faith? No. 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 When, do we, when do we stop? When we, get to heaven. when we get to heaven. We receive our glorified body. That's kind of the culmination of our salvation in Jesus Christ. So there needs to be growth. There needs to be growth personally. There needs to be growth corporately in the body of Christ. And over these next coming weeks, we're going to be looking at that from different uh, passages of Scripture on specific topics, but really studying the Scripture first and then drawing application uh, for that. So let's dive into our text tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we are going to begin in verse 14. So 2 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, he's writing to churches. The New Testament church age is uh, becoming, well, it is established. Churches are growing. There's still great persecution. Paul is writing, of course, the church of Corinth was really uh, messed up in many regards. He's setting some things in order, and he's writing uh, to the churches, and he really speaks about himself as 
as well. So let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, and we'll read all the way through verse 21, actually. So join me as we read 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for the position that we have in you because of our salvation that you have provided to us. Thank you for that gift. God, I would be remiss to say there might be someone in here who has never placed their faith in you for salvation. Help them to realize that They need a different uh, position. They need to put their uh, faith, the saving knowledge that you provide uh, through Jesus Christ, that grace through faith that Ephesians talks about. But God, as we look at our position as new creatures in Christ tonight, I pray that we would draw application that would be beneficial. We know your scripture is beneficial for us. Help us not to get in the way of what you're trying to teach us through your Holy Spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it's going to be a little bit of a, a, a preaching series, a teaching series, a little bit of a feedback series. You know, I can see some of you don't be thinking about Whopper Wednesday at Burger King. Don't be thinking about that new strawberry frosty that you're going to get after church. Let's try to focus in. And I will say for me personally as well, if you work all kinds of thoughts come in your head about work. Oh man, I didn't email this person. Oh man, I forgot to close out this conversation with this individual or that. Or maybe you have something going on at home. Or maybe you want to go watch your favorite show when you get home. Great. But if you're thinking about that above what God is trying to teach us tonight, you are not going to receive anything. Or maybe you're thinking about dipping those Chick-fil-A fries and that Chick-fil-A milkshake. Great but not right now. Let's focus in on what God has for us. So the first thing we want to look at tonight is number one, a compelling love. What does Paul say again in verse 14? For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now, there are many viewpoints on, is it just talking about compelling? Is it talking about captivating? What is Paul trying to say here? Well, if we go back and look at the scriptures as they were written many years ago, that thought uh, com- that thought constrained means to uh, arrest as if, uh, as if a prisoner was in, was in bonds, uh, to preoccupy, to hold, to keep in, to press, to be in a strait, to be taken with. Paul was overcome with the love of Christ, and because of that, it compelled him to bring this message to the church of Corinth and, of course, to many churches during this time. What does the love of Christ do for you? Is it, oh, great, the love of Christ, that's a great concept. Yeah, salvation. But I want you to think about it. God's love, for God so loved the world. You, m- me, I'm a, we are a part of the world. What does the love of Christ do for you? Well, it should do many things. Does it compel you to participate? Are you consumed with joining in the body of Christ? Or is it just an afterthought? I think uh, Patrick Henry said it well last week. Yes, we still have COVID, and unfortunately many are still getting it, and some folks in our church. 
But that has really become a great excuse for us to say, uh, you know what, I'm going to live stream tonight. I'm going to sit this one out. Or, you know what, they're not going to miss me because of this or that. Yes, we miss you. Yes, when you don't show up, when I don't show up, the body of Christ is not functioning as well as it should be. You know, have you ever tried to run um, a race barefooted? You know, the church is a body of Christ, right? So if we're accomplishing a mission together, if one member of the body is not here or this or that, we cannot function as God desires for us to function. So Paul, he was consumed with the love of Christ. The love of Christ, Spurgeon said, had pressed Paul's energies into one force, turned them into one channel, and then drove them forward with a wonderful force till he and his fellows had become a mighty power for good, ever active and energetic. We are not supposed to be boring Christians. Who wants to be boring? You ever had a boring, can you remember, think about it in your school career. Think about the most, don't say their name, (laughs) the most boring teacher you have ever had. Can you picture that individual in your mind? Have we, a show of hands, can you remember the most boring teacher that you've ever had? Some, okay. I guess if you were homeschooled, maybe you only had one teacher your entire life, but hey, homeschool high five. High five yourself. Paul, what was said of Paul and his, his uh, disciples or uh, Titus, Timothy, those disciples in the New Testament, what did it say they did? They turned the world what? You don't turn the world upside down by being boring, by just being very vanilla in your message. I'm not saying we need to shout it all the time, but the message of the gospel needs to be interactive. The message of the gospel needs to be, uh, needs to be energetic. The message of the church needs to be energetic. The message that we bring to others about the love of Christ needs to be just like what Paul is describing. We are consumed with the love of Christ, and because of that, we are in a specific position, and we're going to look at that more in a minute, but Paul was ever consumed with that. Acts 18.5 tells us this, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. What does the love of Christ or the love of God cause us to do? It causes us to testify of the love that we have experienced. If you have truly experienced salvation in Jesus Christ, you are going to want to tell somebody about it. Testimony through maybe a track, through maybe sharing with them uh, directly, But that position that Paul found himself in was one of uh, constraining. He was a prisoner. He was captive by the love of Christ, and that compelled him to share that with others. Do you believe the gospel? Only about two. That's all right. That's all right. Some time ago, an 18-year-old girl from Washington State attended a worship service. For the first time in her life, she heard the gospel message. The following Tuesday, the members of the church received a letter from her. It read, Dear church members, Last Sunday I attended your church, and I heard the preacher. In the sermon, the preacher said that all men have sinned and rebelled against God. Because of their rebellion and disobedience, they all face eternal damnation and separation from God. But then he also said, God loves man and sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem men from their sins and that all those who believe in him would go to heaven and live with God eternally. My parents recently died in rapid succession. I know they did not believe in Jesus Christ, who you call the Savior of the world. If what you believe is true, they are damned. You compel me to believe that either the message is true, that you yourself don't believe this message, or that you don't care. You see, we only live three blocks from the church, and no one ever told us. How sad. It's one thing to have the love of Christ in us, but what is the love of Christ? What should it do in you, in me? It should compel us to tell others. 
the position that we find ourselves in as new creatures in Christ, which we'll look at in a few verses, that love should captivate us. Many things in our lives captivate us, including me, hobbies, uh, whatever it may be, fishing, video games. I don't know. What do you all do? Sudoku, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, cooking, watching TV. It's so easy to get involved in those, and they're not, they're not inherently wrong. But when that is our focus, and that's what compels us, we get really compelled to, catch, to make sure we catch our TV show right at the specific time, including me. I get really compelled to get in the tree stand at the specific time I need to because I know the deer that I think are come, coming that never come after four hours, I got to get there at that specific time. But am I compelled to share the message of Christ? Or when I'm compelled, do I actually heed the call of the Holy Spirit? Not always. And shame on me. So church, what are you doing? Well, the Bible talks about our state before Christ. Our position before Christ was this, Ephesians 2.1. You know, we before Christ, we're in a very deplorable condition, Matthew Henry says. Christ died for these deplorables, if you will. They were lost and undone, dead and ruined, and must have remained thus miserable forever if Christ had not died for them, if Christ had not died for us. Ephesians 2, 1 says this, and you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Colossians 2, 13 and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he what? Quickened. He's made us alive. Together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So, a compelling love. The compelling love should call, cause us to talk about, number two, a compassionate Savior. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. And that he died for all, that they which should live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. He died for all. All means all. There is no magical number that God gets to and says, oh, that's it. No more, no one else into heaven. You don't take a number. You know, I can remember going to Nick's of Clinton as a kid and you go to the sub counter, right? And you take that old number out of that, you know, little red rotary thing, number whatever. Uh, remember at the DMV since, you know, the past couple of years, now they do appointments. But, you know, remember at the DMV, you'd get a specific number. Six hours later, you'd finally get your driver's license. Okay after you've done every crossword puzzle and every maze in the book that you bought. But he died for all. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. This was our position before Christ. Our position was, we were sinners. We still are sinners, but in a different form where our sin nature was uh, sending us to hell. We were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Paul is saying, and that he died for all. John 3, 16 through 17. Somewhat of a common verse, you would say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why don't we share the gospel more than we do? May I propose to you that we are just lazy? Right. We all have characteristics of laziness. We have a phrase in our house, and I think it stems from, I, I forget, we were doing some work, and you know, you're trying to train up your children, and moments as a dad, you always don't really get it right. <laughs> you ever been there as a parent? You're trying to instruct but maybe you're a little too harsh. Um, and I can remember, I said a phrase, I said, we are Morgans and we're not lazy. So now that's a, a phrase, you know, we say, we are Morgans and the kids say, and we're not lazy. <laughs> 
So, but we all have those traits of laziness. Maybe we don't want to get up when we should. Maybe we stay up too late when we shouldn't. Maybe we don't do this or that. We let the grass get a little too tall. Oh, we let that crumb that's been on this floor in the same tile square for a month, we just leave it there because an ant has got to come by at some point and take that crumb away for us. From, um, yeah, for us. But we can get lazy. We don't share the gospel as we should. And, and oftentimes we, we say, well, you know, I, I just can't or I'm, I'm fearful. And I guess th- I would say there is a measure of truth in there. But it really comes down to you just don't want to. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to share the gospel with some random guy at a gas station. Uh, it's awkward. We're afraid of the awkwardness, but we're also lazy not to power through that awkwardness sometimes. So we need to pray for boldness. We need to obey what God tells us. So all means all. He died for all that they should live not henceforth, or excuse me, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. So 1 John 2.2. 2. Some people say, well, this is, this is indicating um, that Christians, these are, Paul's talking to Christians already. Yes, in some sense. Uh, that we, uh, we are identifying with Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel, as uh, he, he talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe. But there's two views here, and I'll give you two different verses. So 1 John 2.2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, so there's the all means all. So that's one viewpoint. And then the other viewpoint is when Paul is talking here, he's more so equating those who are already believers, uh, giving them a little bit more of an, in, uh, an illustration of their life now in Christ and the example of Christ. So Romans 6, um, and we'll read uh, verses 1 through 6. Romans 6, verses 1 through 6. So one viewpoint, he is, the, he is the satisfactory payment. He's the substitutionary payment for our sins. All means all. And yes, that is true. But then also when we place our faith in Christ, we are identifying, uh, we receive the gospel, the, the death, burial, and the resurrection are the validation of our faith. So Romans 6, 1 through 6, Paul says, tells us this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. There's that identification. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. So he died for all both viewpoints Uh, I'm just kind of giving them to you. You can draw your own conclusion there. He did die for all, but also Paul is perhaps equating uh, and and representing that our salvation in Christ, when we receive Christ, we are are buried with him in baptism, obviously through the physical manifestation of baptism. We are raised again in newness of life, as often you hear when folks uh, get baptized. So either view there, both, I would say, carry a measure of application. But he says this, which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Are you living for yourself? The momentum that is expected of us, if we're living for ourselves, uh, we are not going to experience the momentum that Christ wants us to experience. You know, there is all kinds of marketing around us for self, self-help, worth, health, money, uh, I make, I make $6,000 a week working from home. Ask me how. It used to be more uncommon, you know, at now a lot of people work from home now the past couple of years, but you remember those, hey, you can work from home before most people worked from home and it was popular. Hey, I make this, I make thousands of dollars a week and I only work 15 minutes a day. Ask me how. Or maybe, you know, uh, whatever it may be, this sham wow will change your life. You never need to buy another dishcloth again if you just buy this one sham wow. Who remembers the sham wow? Raise your hand if you've bought a sham wow. Okay. All right. Uh, OxyClean, you know, buy it now. Two, 
two for 20, but if you buy it in the next five minutes, it's still two for 20, you know, you get caught on that. There's all kinds of marketing around us for ourselves, but let's think about others. Contrary to modern thought, we're not created to please ourselves. We are created for whose glory? God's glory. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So, how are you doing with that? Does the love of Christ compel you? Are you consumed with sharing that love with others? Think about a, our compassionate Savior, what he's done for us. What is that doing for you? And then thirdly, let's look at this, a creation in Christ. Well, we just saw from the book of Revelation that we were created to bring glory and honor. We were created to bring pleasure uh, to God. So 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. We are a creation in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, Paul is kind of wrapping up the previous verses. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are not a, new, we are not a creature out of like some primordial soup. You know, we're just didn't like come forth like Gumby and all of a sudden become, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Christian. We are created by God. And if we are in Christ, this is specifically about our position in Christ now, not before Christ. So we are saved. So we, the love of Christ constrains us, constrains us it consumes us, it, it consumes us to tell others about Christ. And then Paul reminds us about our position in Christ as believers. We are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, there it is again, any man, all means all, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Any man, whoever, whatever, anyone, no one is exempt from this promise. Spurgeon said this, I know no language, I believe there is none, that can express a greater or more thorough and more radical renewal than that which is expressed in the term a new creature. So we are new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old things are passed away, passed away, ceasing. It ceases to exist. We are new creatures in Christ. These old things are passed away. It's a declaration there. It's not a, oh, if you're a new creature in Christ, maybe the old things are passed away. No, the old things are passed away. If you are truly a believer, the old things are passed away. I'm not saying you may struggle from time to time. I may struggle from time to time, but there should not be a propensity toward those things because all things are become new. Colossians 3.10 tells us this. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We are renewed in Christ. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, are we physically washed by the, the blood of Jesus Christ? It's a rhetorical question. No. But think about that picture, okay? Think about the sweatiest day that you've ever had. Maybe you were working. You got dirt all over you. And in our, my line of work, I can just remember days where literally I had dirt in my teeth from wearing a backpack blower for five hours. Uh, in the dark, um, having one of my good friends ask me, are you going to fire me? If you want to fire me, I totally understand. Said, no, I'm not going to fire you. We just got to get through this. Think about that day. You get home, you get a shower, and you wash the filth and the dirt off of you. You know, our kids, they love to wear Crocs. It's like the universal shoe. 
And we, I talked about laziness earlier. It's like the parent's lazy shoe for children. It's amazing. You don't have to worry about tying your kid's shoe. You just put them in Crocs and call it good. But, you know, Crocs, you know, they have holes in them, and kids' feet get dirty. So, you know, we have an a understood and unwritten rule. When you come home and you've worn Crocs, you stay outside and you wash your feet at the hose, and then you come inside to get that dirt off of you. And when we have placed our faith and our salvation is in Jesus Christ, he washed that dirt off of us. He washed us. What does it say in Titus chapter 3? The washing of regeneration. That a new birth has taken place. Not only a new birth, but a renewing of the Holy Ghost. We receive the Holy Spirit of promise, as the book of Ephesians tells us, and we have, we are consumed with God. God consumes us. And a lot of times we resist him, unfortunately. But we are new creatures. Old things should be passed away. You know, Isaiah the prophet, he equates uh, God to the potter. He says this, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. When someone makes a beautiful piece of pottery, they put it on a wheel, right? Maybe they have an automatic button or, you know, they have the, the pedal and they make uh, a beautiful pot. God is our potter and we are the clay. But picture this in your mind. We're the clay, right? But we always, we jump off the wheel. We're just like, ah, I don't need, I don't need God. He doesn't, you know, we don't say it out loud. But we, we think it in some regards. Um, you know what? I think I can handle this on my own, God. Whoop! Off the pottery. Off the pottery wheel. God's trying to shape us. God is trying to mold us. He's trying to make us into a beautiful vase. He's trying to make us into a beautiful specimen of a Christian. And we resist God by getting off that pottery wheel. And if you think about it in the Old Testament, they, God had a plan and they resisted God. And we say, oh, how could those Israelites be so foolish? How could they do that? Moses was literally speaking to God up on the mountain. And they were down there, what? Melting their earrings, building a golden statue. I, I like it at the end, though. Uh, was it Moses made them drink it, right? They melted ground about, drink. yeah, ground and drink it. It's like kind of, oh, yeah, take that for trying to, trying to uh, make, a, make an image in, in place of God. But we do that ourselves, right? Hobbies, uh, TV, food, work, whatever it may be. Let that not be said of us. Let's let God be the potter in our lives. Because why? We are, we are created by him. We are new creatures in Christ. So how should we act? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Let's go there together. I know a lot of verses tonight. But better that I let the Bible tell you God's opinion than me just kind of saying fancy words. So let's let the scriptures teach us. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, lifestyle, way of life, the what? The old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be what? renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's interesting. Sometimes you would expect some grand language but Paul really dumbs it down for us. Old man, new man. That's pretty easy to understand about how often do I, how often do you, knowing that we've put off the new man as a new creation in Christ, we go up and pick up those old dirty clothes and put them back on because we like our sin or we like this or that. We should not be doing that because the Bible says that those things are passed away. They have ceased to exist our righteousness in Christ, the old man, God doesn't view us as that. He views us as a new creature in Christ. So we are a creation in Christ. And then 
Fourthly, let's look at this, a commitment of reconciliation. I know a pastor often goes to these verses, and so we want to look at them again uh, tonight. Actually, I think it's in, uh, I have the wrong reference here, verse 18 actually. 2 Corinthians 5.18 tells us this, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling means to change, to exchange as coins for others of equivalent value, to reconcile, to return to favor with, to be reconciled to one, to receive one into favor. You ever traveled abroad and exchanged money before in a foreign country? And we as Americans, we always think that, man, you know, our, our money, no problem. I'm going to get thousands of dollars back for my $10. That's not often the case, is it? Or maybe you don't understand the exchange rate and you give them like, you know, I don't know, $100. And then you get the money back and you're like, I should be having more. Well, no, sir, this is what it's uh, worth in, here in this country. I know I experienced that in Guatemala, I guess it's been three years ago now. You kind of exchange money and then in your mind, again, I was thinking, yeah, a bunch of money and um, no, I got limited funds back. I will say that. But when you think of that word reconcile, it's like exchanging. So we have exchanged the old man for the new man. But in that process, our relationship with Christ has also been reconciled. God didn't go anywhere. We're brought back into favor with Christ. Our sin nature, what does the Bible say in Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no matter what we do, there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to get to God because we fall short. There is that separation. You think of the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, I can't come there. There is that separation. The same in our Christian life, but that reconciliation gives us back that exchange of that relationship that God desires with his children, with the new creatures in Christ. So, uh, there is a commitment. There is a ministry. This ministry is not only for uh, those in the church who their job, you know, pastors or missionaries or a specific people group. This is for all of us. So he has what? He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. But he has also, in verse 19, committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Paul goes back here and he says that God was in Christ. Rightly said, Jesus Christ is God. God is uh, Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. The Trinity. They are all the same. And it's kind of hard for us to sometimes wrap our minds around that. But God was in Christ. And what was he doing? He was reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and he has, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So what are we supposed to be doing with that? It's committed to us. So what are we supposed to be doing? What does that mean? We are to be telling others about what? The word of reconciliation. What is that? It's another way to say you should be sharing what Jesus did for you and telling others, telling your story of how you were reconciled back to God, how you were uh, separated from God, but in your salvation in Jesus Christ, you have now been reconciled into that relationship with God. First Timothy 1.11 Paul was telling Timothy this, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Titus 1, 3, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. Paul is talking according to the commandment of our God and Savior. So are you committed to the word of reconciliation? God was in Christ. He didn't impute, impute the trespasses that we uh, did past, fu or past, present, future. All that was put on Jesus Christ. He, he reconciled us back to him. Verse 20. Couriers of truth. I had to find a alliterated word to just match with the theme tonight. A courier of truth. An ambassador Verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. 
What is an ambassador? Someone who represents. If there was ever an ambassador, if like Chick-fil-A needed an ambassador, sign me up. If McDonald's needed an ambassador, sign me up. I just love McDonald's. I managed not to eat it for like four months and then all it takes is like a bite of a stale McChicken and I'm back. <laughs> I had one the other day and I don't know how long that McChicken had been sitting out or how old it was, but if you're into disc golf, you know, throwing Frisbees, I probably could have thrown that thing at least 50 yards. I mean, that thing was really hard. Anyways, it was good. So a representative of whatever it may be, the United States, other, other countries, they have ambassadors. They have representatives. We... As believers, our position in Jesus Christ, we have that word of reconciliation. It has been committed to us, and we are to be a representative of that to others. We are ambassadors for who? For ourselves? No, we're ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives. You know, what if an ambassador went to another country and they said, uh, you know what? My country sent me here, but, you know, really, I'm not all about living in my country. How about you let me live here? Would that be a good ambassador or a bad ambassador? <laughs> bad, right? If I was the ambassador for said McDonald's, and I said, yeah, and you know what? I'm here to pump up the brand, but you know what? Don't tell anybody, but I actually work for Burger King. I'm undercover. That'd be a bad ambassador, and many times as Christians, we are bad ambassadors. Maybe we say a, a slight comment to our husband or wife in, in a, at a grocery store, or we think that no one is watching us, and we are misrepresenting Christ. We are not being a good ambassador. He's saying this in verse 20, as though God did uh, beseech you by us. The message that we deliver, and actually it's not, I might not say as if, but it is. God is speaking through us. The Holy Spirit is speaking through us when we are representing Christ. So Paul says, as though God did beseech you by us. Paul is saying, hey, the mode that we are giving this message to you is uh, as if God was literally speaking through me. So of course we know it's not God's literal voice or the literal voice of Jesus speaking through Paul. It's the Holy Spirit as Paul is delivering this message, as Paul is uh, penning the words of Scripture through what inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost is moving him to put a pen to paper. Matthew 5.14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You know, we sing the songs, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. It's like we leave Sunday school and we get into adulthood in our various stages of life. And we may not sing that song because it's, oh, it's a, you know, it's a kid's song. Hide it under a bushel, no. But do we often hide it under a bushel, don't we? We just don't sing it. We, in our minds, we say, hide it under a bushel, yes, instead of no. We should not be hiding our lights. When it's dark, where do bugs always go to? The light. Rebecca always gets, not gets on me, but it's kind of a running joke. Um, when I go, get home, you know, the, if the lights are on, as soon as I get in the door, I turn off the front porch light. And probably this has to do with my, um, my upbringing, I would say. Because I don't want any bugs in the house. Bugs <coughs> are attracted to light. But think about that. If you're, if you're lost, and if you've ever been real lost, where do you try to go? Somewhere where there, somewhere where there is light. We are the light of the world. The world is lost. Can the world see our light? Can the world see your light? Can the world see my light? Are we sharing the gospel? At Pray and Go, I know many folks are busy. I'll just say it. I haven't attended every Pray and Go for one reason or another. But if your schedule allows and you're just sitting at home on a Saturday and you're not participating in getting the message of the gospel to others, you're actually sinning. I'm actually sinning. 
when I disobey the commandment of Christ. I'm not saying that to condemn. I'm saying that that, that should be inspiration to us. If, if we really believe that we are the light of the world, then we should be taking the light of the gospel to the world. Because why? We are couriers of truth. We are deliverers of the message. We are not deliverers of your literal soul going from uh, unredeemed to redeemed. Our job is to just get the message to the individual. Amazon's job is to get the package to you. Their job is not to go inside your house, open the package up, and set it up for you. No, they just get, they get it to you. And that is our job as well as believers. We are to get the message because we are couriers of truth. Let's look in verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. That's Jesus. That is hard to wrap my mind around in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Jesus became sin Think about that. The, the, the essence, the characteristics of sin, Jesus became. Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had to turn his back on that. God cannot look on that. But Jesus became sin for who? For us who knew no sin. He didn't know sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We hear pastor often say we are just as righteous as Jesus. When I first heard that, I don't know, almost 10 years ago, I was like, what? How can this be? Well, here's, here's the scripture. He's made, we are made the righteousness of God. Uh, not the righteousness of ourselves, but how are we made the righteousness of God? Through Jesus Christ, in him. Lastly, and I forgot to talk about this verse when we were talking about ambassadors, but I do want to mention it. Proverbs 13, 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. It's healthy to be a proper representative of Jesus Christ. So as we dive into momentum over the next few weeks, we first have to understand that in order to have momentum as God desires, we first have to be a, a believer. We have to be a Christian. Without that, you don't have any uh, momentum. And our position is what? Well, we are new creatures in Christ. So, just we'll go over it briefly. What is the love of Christ compelling you to do, as Paul was talking about? It's, it, is it constraining you? Is it consuming you? Does it have you captivated? Is it captivating you in a way that causes you to want to share about our compassionate Savior and what he has done for us? And as you are compelled to tell about Christ, are you sharing the message of how you're a new creation in Christ? Are those old things passed away? Are those old things getting in the way of you being able to share the gospel? And are you committed to the ministry of reconciliation? as Paul talks about. We have a ministry, and the ministry is to share about how we have been reconciled, how our relationship is in right standing with God, but we have that commitment of the word of reconciliation. And as we're sharing that message, are we being faithful couriers of truth? Are we representing Christ in a proper fashion? I know I have things to work on. Maybe you've thought of something that you have uh, to work on as well. And I'm just looking forward to just continuing to study the scriptures and really understand more about what does God have to say about uh, believers. And I think really after this, this couple year funk that the world has been in due to COVID and things like that, I think the church is really at a, a crossroads or maybe not a crossroads. It's either one way or the other. We can either go backwards as a body of believers or we can go forwards and amidst all the craziness that is going on, the Bible still has not changed. The message of the gospel has not changed. 
the, the modes and the methods and the culture has maybe changed and maybe there's different ways we can get the gospel, but that doesn't change the obedience. The method of obedience didn't change. God has still t- tells us to, to share the gospel. We have that commitment. So I encourage you to, to um, think about that. Um, I will make my notes available. If you, if you like any of my notes for your own personal study, I'm happy to email them to you. You can find my cell phone number in the church app if you have that. Be happy to send it along, but let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for your word. I pray, God, that I would be more obedient to share the gospel with others. <clears throat> if we are truly constrained by the love of Christ as Paul was, then that would naturally cause us to flow out, flow out from, our, from our very being, our essence, as a new creature in Christ, the message of the gospel. Help us not to hide the message, God. It is so easy for one reason or another, whether by laziness, fear, uh, lack of understanding. God, you have given us all the tools that we need. Yes, we can glean ideas from others. We can encourage each other. We can disciple each other. And we, those are all great things. But we also need to just adopt um, these things personally before anything. We need to be obedient. God, help us to do that. We thank you so much for using Paul, really someone who went, did a total 180 from killing Christians to becoming a Christian to seeing thousands of Christians come to the saving knowledge of you. God, we ask as we, Lord willing, finish our week and return on Sunday that you would put at least one person in our path to share the gospel with. And when that person comes in in front of us or we talk to them on the phone or by email, whatever it may be, that your Holy Spirit would be so uh, intense in that moment that we would uh, heed that that, uh, prodding and that we would share the gospel that we may not necessarily see them saved right there and then at that moment, but God, that we would be obedient to share the message of Christ. I pray that you would help us to, to listen to that, help us to be sensitive to that, God. And perhaps next uh, Wednesday, we'd be able to hear of a testimony of how you have put someone in our path to share the gospel with. And we thank you so much, God, for our church. We thank you for our pastoral leadership. We pray that you would continue to keep pastors safe Uh, As he travels, we pray that you bring him back uh, home safely. And God, again, we mentioned VBS, and we ask that you would, uh, again, get the glory for everything that is said and done, and we ask for safety as we travel home. Thank you again for this night that you've given us, and your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.